بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وبه نستعين والصلاة والسلام على خير الخلق وخاتم الأنبياء والمرسلين سيدنا الأولين والآخرين شفي المذنبين رحمة للعالمين وحبيب إله العالمين ولا حبيب إلا هو وأحل الذي سمع في السماء بأحمد وفي العرب بأب القاسم محمد ثم الصلاة والسلام على أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المأثومين المذلومين المنتجبين قال الله العظيم في محكم كتابه الكريم والقول كالحق ولست قل قائلين أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم أن اعبد الله واتقوا وأتيعون يغفر لكم من ذنوبكم ويؤخركم إلى أجل مسمى إن أجر الله إذا جاء لا يؤخر لو كنتم تعلمون قال ربي إني دعوت قومي ليلا ونهارا فلم يزدهم دعائي إلا فرارا وإني كلما دعوتهم لتغفر لهم جعلوا أصابهم في آذانهم واستغشوا ثيابهم وأصروا واستكبروا استكبارا ثم إني دعوتهم جحارا ثم إني أعلنت لهم أسررت لهم مسرارا آمنا بالله صدق الله العلي العظيم وصلى الله على محمد وآل محمد When the prophets of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they come toward preaching toward their communities, before they present the message of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, before they come and they present the the revelation, the wahi from God, the first step, is to make their best effort to purify the hearts of those individuals so that they are receptive to the divine teachings and commandments. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala states in the whole Qur'an, هُوَ الَّذِي بَعَثَ فِي الْأُمِّيِّينَ رَسُولًا مِّنْهُمْ يَتْلُوا عَلَيْهِمْ آيَاتِهِ وَيُزَكِّيهِمْ وَيُعَلِّمُهُمُ الْكِتَابَ وَالْحِكْمَةِ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala states that from you He sent the Prophet and He sent this Prophet with several responsibilities. The first one is that He reminds you of the signs. He teaches you of the signs of Allah. He, be- he makes you reflect. He says, look at the sun and look at the moon. And look at the stars and look at the ocean and look at the trees. All of these things are the creation of Allah. When you see them, you should be reminded of God immediately. The second step is that he makes his best effort to purify the hearts of the people. These individuals during the time of the Holy Prophet ﷺ, for instance, as we know, they lived during this period of Jahiliyyah. They were extremely backward. Their hearts were like stone, they were unable to become receptive to the teachings of the Prophet ﷺ. But slowly after being witness to the mercy and to the glory and due to the etiquette and the akhlaq of Rasulullah, their hearts became soft. And individuals like Ammar, individuals like Abu Dhar, individuals like Salman, they demonstrated their absolute submissive nature toward the Holy Prophet ﷺ. After he gets their hearts to be receptive, وَيُعَلِّمُهُمُ الْكِتَابَ وَالْحِكْمَةِ Then he comes to them, then he comes to his community and preaches toward them the whole Qur'an. But only when their hearts have become purified, then they're able to be receptive toward the teachings of the whole Qur'an. As we mentioned on the first of the month of Ramadan, that the steps that we need to take in order to become amongst those who contemplate the whole Qur'an, be receptive to that which is the whole Qur'an and differentiate ourselves from reciters of the Qur'an like Ibn Muljim, like Shimr, like the Khawarij, is to make sure that we purify our hearts toward the teachings. And at that moment, after our hearts have been purified and cleansed, then we are able to understand the Qur'anic teachings and commandments. In continuing our discussion from last night and over the next couple of nights, inshallah, we're discussing chapter 71 of the whole Qur'an, Surah Nuh. And when we see that Prophet Nuh alayhi salam, he goes toward the community, but they fail to be receptive to everything that he presents toward them. 
even though he preaches for 950 years, generations after generations, fathers and grandfathers and great-grandfathers of same families, he would preach toward them, but they failed to be receptive to everything that he had to say. But there was a reason why. It's because their hearts had not been purified to, be a, to being able to be receptive toward the teachings of the messenger of their time. We go ahead and we see that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala comes forth and continues this conversation that Prophet Nuh alayhi salam has with this community. Let us go ahead and continue our discussion for those of you who are following with verse number 3 of chapter 71 of the whole Qur'an. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala states and he quotes Nuh alayhi salam in verse number 2. قَالَ يَا قَوْمِ إِنِّي لَكُمْ نَذِيرٌ مُبِينٌ He says, O oh my community, I am toward you a manifest warner. And I have certain advices that I want to give to you. He states in verse number 3, أَنِ اعْبُدُ اللَّهَ وَاتَّقُوهُ وَأَتِيُونَ He says, O oh my community, I want to instruct you to do three things. Number one, worship Allah. Pray the way that I instruct you to pray. Make supplication the way that I instruct you to make supplication. Perform all of the rituals that I advise you in the way that I have presented toward you. And Abdullah wa Taqoh. Nuh alayhi salam gives three instructions. Step number one is to make sure that you perform the rituals. You pray and you fast and you go for Hajj. This is number one. Number two, wa Taqullah and have Taqwa in Allah. Meaning, not only can you perform the amal physically but you have to have it in your heart. When we come toward this term taqwa, we see that it's mentioned several times within the whole of Quran. Probably since we're very young, we hear this term taqwa, that we need to have taqwa and so on and so forth. But what exactly does it mean to have taqwa? In the Arabic language, unfortunately, there's no proper translation for this particular term, but oftentimes it's translated as piety or God wariness to constantly be in understanding and recognize the presence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala before you perform an action, while you're performing an action, after you're performing an action, every moment of your life, you see or you feel the presence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala around you, so that any moment before you're about to commit any act of sin or any act of vice, you hold your step, you hold your step back and you say, wait a minute, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the guardian of the heavens and the earth, and there's no way that I can come forth and pursue this particular action. What is taqwa? Let us take a look at this example. Amongst the great ulama of the school of Ahlul Bayt, salam, we have the example of a man or men by the name of Sharif al rabi and Sharif al murtada Sharif al rabi many of you know, is the compiler of Nahj al balagha of Amir al muminin salatu wassalam. And Sharif al murtada is his brother, who is amongst the greatest fuqaha in the school of Ahlul Bayt. Many of those, many of you who have gone to visit Kadhimiya, Imam Musa ibn Ja'far, Imam al-Jawad, you know that these two ulama are buried not far from their blessed shrine in Baghdad in the Kadhimiya district. It is said that these two individuals had reached an, an extremely high level of taqwa of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It is said that after their father passed away, their father had a massive library. He himself was a big scholar. And he stated that, you know, he, he divided up the portion of this library, that the right side, for instance, of this library is for Sharif al murtaba and the left side is for Sharif al radi my other son. Son X and son Y. It is said that when their father passed away, after all of the rituals had become completed, they entered into that library of their father and they began to take their possessions from their inheritance. It is said that at this moment, they are separating all of the books and taking them for themselves. And you know that when someone is a scholar, when someone loves to read, when someone is a student, books are more important to them than any sort of wealth, than any sort of property. It is said that Sharif al murtada and Sharif al radi they notice that in the middle of that line which they cut to divide this particular library, there is one book, half of it is on one side, the other half is on the other side. And they begin to wonder if we cut the book in half, it doesn't have any value anymore, does it? So Sharif al murtada he looks towards Sharif al radi And he says, oh radi let me tell you something. The one who never committed a sin in his life, he gets to keep that book. Meaning Sharif al murtada never committed a sin in his life. Imagine how many sins we committed today while we're fasting on the third day of the month of Ramadan. While we're fasting, how many sins did we commit? How many times did we do a ghibah? 
How many times did we backbite? How many times did we lie? How many times did we, you know, be abusive toward our children, toward our spouses? How many times did we refuse to say wa salam because we don't like someone in the mosque? How many times did we commit sin in the last 15 minutes, in the last half an hour? How many negative thoughts entered into our mind? Sharif al-Murtada, tell, he tells his brother Sharif al radi that this book is for the individual who never committed a sin in his life. What is Sharif al radi going to respond? Naturally, how would you respond? Okay, take the book, man. I'm guilty of that. Sharif al radi he looks toward his brother and he says, this book is for the individual who had never thought about committing a sin in his life. Who never thought about committing a sin in his life. How many thoughts do we have in our life about committing sin? How many times do we think about abusing someone else? How many times do we have a negative thought when we see something? How many times do we think or ponder about committing a sin, but even hold our step back, hold ourselves back? Sharif al-Radi says that this book is for someone who never thought about committing a sin. At this moment, Sharif al-Murtada, he gives it to his brother. He says, you take the book. I don't want to have anything to do with it. This is what it means to have taqwa of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. To constantly seek, to constantly make our best effort to make sure that we fear to even think about transgressing the boundaries of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala quoting Prophet Nuh alayhi salam, giving his instruction toward the people, three responsibilities. Anibudullah, worship Allah with your physical body. Wattaqo, perform that worship with your heart to recognize the presence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Have taqwa, wa'ati'un. And the third responsibility, the third instruction that I give toward you is to make sure that you obey me. We come forth and we provided examples yesterday that people, they had no problem worshiping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They had no problem following the instruction of the whole Qur'an. But when the Holy Prophet ﷺ would say, do this, they would state, oh Rasulullah, what's your evidence? When he says, follow Amir al-Mu'mineen, they have a problem with that. Why? Because they're not ready to follow people. They're not ready to follow their own, which is why many people, they used to go to where the Prophets of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and they would say, oh Prophet of Allah, bring down the angels from the heavens and we'll follow them. But you, we don't want to follow you. They would go walking in the souk, they would eat like people, they would talk to others, they would live with the people, but they didn't like that. They said, we want people, we, we, we want angels from the heavens. We want those who are different than us. But naturally, if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent down angels from the heavens and said, oh humanity, follow these angels, what would we do? We'd find another excuse, that they're unlike us, how can I follow them? They're a different nature, they're a different creation than us, so on and so forth. Man is full of excuses. The human being is full of excuses because we hate responsibility. We go forth and we see that these individuals would constantly provide excuses toward Nuh. Why they didn't want to follow his message? Providing excuses one after the other. Nuh alayhi salam, he continues, advising those in his community, advising those companions of his. In verse number four of chapter 71, وَيُؤَخَّرْكُمْ إِلَىٰ أَجَلٍ مُسَمَّةٍ Nuh salam says, I'm giving you these three instructions to worship Allah, to have taqwa in Allah, and to follow me so that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can reciprocate that and give you benefits. What are these benefits? Number one, lakum dhunubakum. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He wants to forgive your sins. He wants you to forgive sins. According to a narration from one of the Imams of Ahl al-Bayt, Imam al-Baqir alayhi salam, or Imam al-Sadiq alayhi mafdar al-Salatu salam he states that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants from humanity two things. Number one, He wants you to be thankful to Him whenever you received blessing, so we can increase your blessing. Whenever you're in a moment of happiness, say thank you Allah, so that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can give you more. And the second thing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants from us, is that you say, oh Allah, I'm sorry whenever you commit a sin. So we can forgive your sins. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants to give us an excuse to forgive our sins. But we are those who don't want to repent to Allah. Prophet Nuh alayhi salam is telling his followers, he's telling his companions, do these, have taqwa in Allah, worship, follow me, listen to my instruction, so that he can forgive your sins. يَغْفِرْ لَكُمْ مِنْ ذُنُوبِكُمْ وَيُؤَخَّرْكُمْ إِلَىٰ عَجَلٍ مُسَمَّةٍ 
And the second reason why I'm instructing you for this is because I have come to you, as we mentioned yesterday, I have come toward you to warn you of a punishment. A punishment is going to strike from the heavens. What is that punishment? We know, of course, Nuh alayhi salam has to build the ark, the flood comes, it defeats or destroys the entire community, and so on and so forth. Nuh alayhi salam says, I'm coming toward you to instruct you to make sure that this punishment doesn't come and befall you. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if you, ins- if you follow my instruction, He will postpone this particular commandment of His and He won't bring down this punishment. We go back toward the verse. يَغْفِرْ لَكُمْ مِنْ ذُنُوبِكُمْ وَيُؤَخَّرُكُمْ إِلَىٰ أَجَلٍ مُسَمَّىٰ Or perhaps according to another, uh, another interpretation of this particular verse is that for those of us who seek forgiveness from Allah, who follow the prophets of Allah, who do good deeds, who fulfill our rituals and our responsibilities toward Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will increase our lifespan. But for those of us who are constantly transgressing in the boundaries of Allah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will decrease our lifespan. We know, for instance, narrations of Ahlul Bayt, salam, they state for the one who makes relations with his family members, performs Siddhat al-Raham, he hasn't spoken to a cousin on the other side of the world for three, four years. If you pick up the phone, you send an email, you send a text saying, Assalamu alaikum, what's going on? Long time. How's it going? Just this little bit of reaching out toward your family, according to a narration of Ahlul Bayt, salam, it could increase your lifespan between three and 30 years. Just by saying salam to a family member on the other side of the world. How many brothers of ours have we not talk, spoken to? Cousins over a fight, over a dispute that took place years ago in this community. How many times people have come to me? Sheikh, we have this problem with our family. My brother, my sister, my aunt, my uncle, they don't talk to me because I did this and I did that. Do these little bit of actions and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will increase your lifespan. How many of us, we pray for a long life? On the flip side, We come forth and we see that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will decrease the lifespan for cutting off these relationships between our family members, between 3 and 30 years, according to narrations of Ahlul Bayt. Perhaps one act of performing istighfar to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you will increase your life. One day of reciting Salatul Layl, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will state that this individual, because of this devotion that he had to me in the middle of the night, to perform Salatul Layl in the middle of the month of Shah Ramadan, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, will provide us bounties that, incre- that include the increasing of our lives. We go back toward the verse. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He quotes Nabi Nuh, يَغْفِرْ لَكُمْ مِنْ ذُنُوبِكُمْ وَيُؤَخَّرْكُمْ إِلَىٰ عَجَلٍ مُسَمَّةٍ إِنَّ عَجَرَ اللَّهِ إِذَا جَاءَ لَا يُؤَخَّرْ Oh my community, listen to my instruction. If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes that decree and He says He's going to punish you, that's it, it's finished. I can't help you. No matter how many prophets of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make dua for someone after the decree has been made, it's finished. It's over. There's no more turning back. So make sure that you follow my instruction. Listen to me today before you lose the opportunity. Nuh is begging his community and then he concludes by stating, Lo kuntum. Ta'lamun, only if you knew. I wish that you guys take my advice. The prophets of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they have this type of love for their communities. When, when it comes to us, no matter how many times or, or, or how many times do we go toward people within the community and tell them, look, come to the mosque, start praying, start fasting, and there's no paying heed by that individual. Eventually we give up, we say, forget about it, go to hell, we don't care about you anymore, we're done with you, right? But the prophets of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we need to walk in their footsteps because they're constantly giving that effort. They're constantly demonstrating the hujjah to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that look at least I've made an effort toward these individuals, trying to get them to come. But what happened? They would constantly reject the Prophet, the Messenger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And at this moment, now we come toward that conversation between Nuh and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He gave up. He gave up. He says, he's presented so many opportunities to his community, but now he has no one else to go to but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They marginalized him, they neglected him, they put him to the side, they mocked him, no one spoke to him, they boycotted him completely. Nuh alayhi salam says, I cannot go to anyone else except for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Similarly us, when we go through difficulties in our life, when we realize that there's no other way, there's no one to help us, we have to know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He hears our complaints. No matter how many times or no matter how large the difficulty or the trial, the tribulation that we're dealing with, no matter how difficult that moment is in, 
Forget about everyone else. Turn back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Nuh alayhi salam, he reverts back to his home. He raises his hands to Allah or he goes in the state of prostration and he begins to recite these lines. Rabbi, inni da'awtu qawmi laylan wa nahara falam yazidhum du'a'i illa firara wa inni kullama da'awtuhum litaghfir lahum ja'alu asabi'ahum fi a'zanihim wastaghshaw thiyabahum wa asarru wastakbaru istikbara. He goes and he begins to complain to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. One by one, let's take a look at these verses. In verse number five, Nuh alayhi salam says, Qala, Rabbi inni da'awtu qawmi laylan wa nahara. He says, Oh Allah, I've called them and I've invited them in the night and in the day. I've invited my qawm, qawmi laylan wa nahara. Again, we mentioned yesterday that in the first two verses of Surah Nuh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions that Prophet Nuh is going toward Oh, he's going toward his community. And oftentimes in the midst of the context of these verses, Prophet Nuh salam always calls them my community. When people have rejected you time and time again, when you have a family member who no longer you get along with, you say that this individual, this brother, this cousin of mine, he's not even part of my family anymore. Prophet Nuh preaches for 950 years, man. 950 years, and he still says that they're my community. He doesn't give up. They're still my community. No matter how many times they neglect me, and no matter how many times I grow a frustration of them, they're still my community. I have to go back. Oh Allah, guide them. He doesn't give up, doesn't condemn them, doesn't curse them. Rabbi inni da'awtu qawmi laylan wa nahara. I invited them in the night and in the day. He says the night first and in the day. And when we come to the verses of the whole Quran, there is no coincidence. There is no coincidence. Every single word, every single harakah, Every single presentation made by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is for a purpose. And we have to be amongst those who contemplate and find why exactly did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala present it this way. Inni da'awtu qawmi laylan wa nahara. I invited them, I invited my community toward you, O Allah, in the night and in the day. Why does Allah say night before day? Why does He say night before day? Perhaps because he's making this du'a to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the middle of the night. And he's saying, oh Allah, even in the night when people sleep, when I should be sleeping, I didn't sleep. I would go out in the middle of the night and I would beg people to come. I would go toward their homes. I would go toward the marketplaces. During the month of Ramadan, all the young people, they go to Patterson, they're smoking shisha. I would go there and I would try to invite them to come. But they weren't receptive toward me. He's making every single effort, trying to present to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that in the middle of the night, I would even go. In the daytime, I would go. When people were working, I would go to their workplace. And I would say, look, this is the message of Allah. Listen to this instruction. And in the nighttime, when they would be coming home, I would go toward them. Young people who are hanging out at night, I would go toward them, trying to get them to listen to what I have to say. For, all the, for, 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 the, el, for, for the elderly who would wake up early in the morning, go for walks in the streets of Kufa, I would go toward them and I would instruct them as well. As you mentioned, Prophet Nuh, he, pre he preaches his message in Kufa. رب قال رب إني دعوت قومي ليلا ونهارا in the night in the day I made every single effort to get these people to come. رب قال رب إني دعوت قومي ليلا ونهارا فلم يزدهم دعائي إلا فرارا. But unfortunately, oh Allah, every time I call them toward your religion, they used to run away from me. You know, sometimes when we have become witness toward the truth. When we're young, our mothers, our fathers, they tell us, don't do this. If you do this, you're going to get in trouble. And we say, don't worry, we're going to do it. We do it, we get in trouble, and they throw it in our face right away. I told you not to do it. What do we say? No, 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 I, it didn't happen like that. We present all these excuses because we don't want to submit to the fact that we are wrong. In spite, we'll continuously defend our decision even though we're wrong. What happens to these individuals? 950 years, as you mentioned, generation after generation, right? Narrations, they come forth and they tell us, that fathers, they would take their sons to Prophet Nuh salam, and they would say, oh my son, when you grow older, this man's still going to be walking in the streets begging you to come to the religion. Stay away from him. He's a crazy guy. Back off from him. He's gone delirious. He's, an, he's, he's out of his mind. Don't listen to any of his instruction. Right? So Prophet Nuh salam, had to deal with this type of animosity. He had to deal with this type of struggle with the people who were surrounding him. Right? He says, oh Allah, every single time I made an attempt, they would run away from me. I tried to beg them toward coming, they refused. 
even though some people they began to realize that there's a little bit of you know there's a little bit of wisdom there's a little bit of knowledge in terms of what this man is saying in spite of that they said you know what our fathers our grandfathers i've rejected him a million times you know there's no way i can now admit that i was wrong all of these years and submit toward the religion right there should be no shame to do that when we see the truth we should be willing to submit toward the truth but Prophet Nuh السلام, never had that opportunity. Very few people, as we mentioned, they were willing to submit toward the religion of Allah. فَلَمْ يَزِدْهُمْ دُعَائِي إِلَّا فَرَارَ Every time I would increase my invitation toward them, they would increase in their running away from me. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala continues. In verse number 7, وَإِنِّي كُلَّمَا دَعُوتُهُمْ لِتَغْفِرَ لَهُمْ جَعَلُوا عَصَابِئَهُمْ فِي عَظَانِهِمْ وَاسْتَغْشَوْ ثِيَابَهُمْ وَأَصَرُّوا وَاسْتَكْبَرُوا إِسْتِكْبَارًا Nuh alayhi salam continues complaining to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He says, Oh Allah, and every time I went toward them and I said, Oh people, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants to forgive you. What is he calling you toward? He's not giving him any sort of legislation at this moment. If Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa ta'ala, we were living during that time, and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa ta'ala from the very first day said, start praying five times a day. You have to go for hajj. You have to fast during the month of Ramadan. We'd be like, come on bro, back off. We're not interested in all of this, right? What would we do? We'd run away from him. But that's not what the prophets did. The prophets, they went and they began to tell people about the mercy of Allah. They went to go and tell them about the rewards of paradise. They went to go and tell them about how good they're going to feel if they submitted toward Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Positivity first, yeah? And then legislation. Nuh alayhi salam, he goes toward his community and he tells them, the only thing that I'm trying to tell them is that you're going to forgive all of their sins. But they don't want to have anything to do with it. What do they do? Every time I told them that, look, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants to forgive your sins, they took their fingers and they put it into their ears. Interestingly enough, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, or Prophet Nuh alayhi salam, doesn't state, oh Allah, they put their fingertips in their ears like we do. You put your finger. Can we really put our entire finger on our ear? It's not going to work, right? Unless we have something wrong, right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Nuh alayhi salam is complaining to Allah, says they're putting their entire fingers in their ears, meaning they want to have absolutely nothing to do with this. Every single time I say, come to listen to me, they say, they put their fingers in their ears. He's, the, the narrations, they come and they said that Nuh alayhi salam walked in the streets. He would walk in the marketplace. The minute that he would walk, they would just put their fingers in their ears saying, get away from us, we don't have anything to do with you, la la la, don't, don't talk, right? And just get, get out of our faces. Like children do when they don't want to listen to what their parents have to say. Right? Of course, all of us kids, we listen very attentively and very well, so we don't have this problem. And the minute that he used to walk into any of their gatherings, if they were wearing hoods, they used to put it on their hood. They used to put it on their head. They used to take their cloths and cover it on their faces. Oh God, Nuh again? Do we really have to deal with this guy again? Right? In order to demonstrate their animosity toward him, in order to demonstrate the fact that, you know, they don't want to talk to this guy. In a couple of moments, after we're time to break our fast, we go downstairs for iftar. There are some people I want to talk to them because I haven't seen them in the mosque for a long time. I say, brother, salam alaikum, what's going on? Long time. Right before I try to go and say salam to him, he turns around. He says, oh, Shaykh is coming. I don't want to talk to him. Let me go make sure I sit in the corner. So I don't have to eat. This is what they used to do to the Prophet of Allah. Right? He wants to come and invite them. And they want to, you know, put their cloth on their faces, put on their hoods, walk away, put on their headphones. We can't hear you. We don't want anything to do with you. Right? This was the custom of the people that Nuh alayhi salam had to deal with. Istikbar, oh Allah. And every time I even made the slightest effort, they would demonstrate their arrogance in front of me. They would walk away. They would ignore me. They would boycott me. They wouldn't talk to me. I would talk to them. And they would nod their heads and then just walk away. They would do everything rude in order to demonstrate that they wanted absolutely nothing to do with me. He continues his complaining to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Thumma inni da'autuhum jihara he says, Oh Allah, then I went and I began to invite them in their public gatherings. I began to invite them loudly. 
according to some of the Mufassirin, this means that Nuh السلام, would go to their public gatherings whenever they, had, whenever they had a festival, whenever they would have a public holiday, he would go and try to get the microphone and say, hey, listen to what I have to say. And everyone would start dispersing, they wouldn't listen to anything that he had to. Another group of the Mufassirin, they state that Nuh السلام, had become so neglected, he felt, he felt so neglected and felt so marginalized from the community because there was a time, 950 years is a long time, that the group of people within that community, they began to completely ignore him by not saying one word to him. They would listen to him, but they would not say one word to him. So Nuh السلام, would try to get up in their faces. And he would start screaming at them, Please talk to me! Please listen to me! Listen to my instruction! But they would just walk away. It would break the heart of Nuh السلام, that every one of these individuals would not be receptive to the slightest word that he had to say. He would go toward their public gatherings, speak to them loudly, make you know, public service an- a- announcements, do everything that he could to get these people to fall in line, to listen to his instruction, to at least get one heart, to get one soul to be receptive to what he had to say. But it was very, very difficult. He continues in verse number 9. ثُمَّ إِنِّي أَعْلَنْتُ لَهُمْ وَأَسْرَرْتُ لَهُمْ when I realized that this public portrayal of preaching the message was not working very well, what did I do? I began to reach out to people individually. I started going to individuals' homes. Nuh السلام, in the middle of the night would knock the doors of people. And he would try to get a gathering with them. Imagine what it would be to get a gathering with the Messenger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in your home. What would they do? They would shut the door on his face. They would shut the door on his face. But oftentimes we see that Nuh السلام, would be in those gatherings, he would be preaching toward the people loudly in those public gatherings of theirs, and sometimes he would see one person, two people, and he would see that their tears would begin to roll down from their eyes. Because maybe they had a potential to be receptive, or they had a little bit of sympathy for the Messenger of Allah. So what, he, what would he do? He would go to those individuals' homes, with the hope that those individuals would be able to convert the rest of their family at least. Nuh السلام, would get these gatherings. He would sit with those families. He would begin to teach them, would begin to preach toward them. He would give a khutbah, he would recite a majlis for them, whatever it was. Sometimes they would be receptive, but then they were embarrassed in front of their family members. Everyone else is neglecting this seemingly crazy man who was an elder. He was an elder of the community, yes? 950 years preaching. As he mentioned, the narration state that he lives 2,500 years. They didn't care the fact that he was, you know, the elder statesman of the community. They didn't care. He had family relations with people in that society. They didn't care. Right? So Nuh السلام, would go toward these individuals. Some of them would be receptive to, for a moment. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in this verse, ثُمَّ إِنِّي أَعْلَنْتُ لَهُمْ وَأَسْرَرْتُ لَهُمْ إِسْرَارًا That he even went toward them in secret and said, look, even if you submit toward the religion, even if you believe in God, it's just between you and I. You don't have to tell anyone. I don't, I'm not seeking anything from you. All I'm asking is that you believe in God, that you leave your idols, you leave this life that you had been living. Follow my instruction. Listen to my instruction. But what happened? The majority of the people in that society, they neglected him. They marginalized him. They kept him to the side. They had nothing, they wanted nothing to do with what he had to say. Prophet Nuh السلام, he would make these du'as, he would complain to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, realizing and recognizing that the only individual or the only power to hear him is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we go and we see, my dear brothers and sisters, that this is a custom of all of the 124,000 prophets of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Every one of them would go toward preaching toward their community, but no one had the least effort to demonstrate their love or their loyalty to what their prophets had to say. The Holy Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam, Allahumma salli alayhi wa He preaches the religion of Islam for 23 years, the revelation of the whole Qur'an. This is a Rasulullah. He asked them to do one thing. He gave them one instruction when it was all said and done. He said, make sure that after me, you take care of my family. Make sure that after me, you respect my daughter. Make sure that after me, you follow Ali ibn Abi Talib. Make sure that after that, after that you recognize that the doors to paradise are al hasani wal Hussein. Imam al Hussein on the day of Ashura, he is standing in the plains of Karbara. And what does he do? How many sermons does he give on the day of Ashura? Inviting them to come toward Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. For those of us 
We've read the maqtal of Imam al Hussein alayhi salam. Basically, the entire day of the day of Ashura is Imam al Hussein advising those to make sure that they don't follow into the trap and enter into the fires of hell on their own, but rather they have the ability to just walk in the footsteps of Sayyid Shabab Ahl al Jannah, Imam al Hussein alayhi salatu wasalam. Imam al Hussein alayhi salam, in those last moments of his life, he looks toward those, the army of Amr bin Sa'd. And he says, according to one of the narrations, he looks toward the enemy camp in his last moments after every one of his family members have passed away when he himself has his blessed body lying on the plains of Karbala. And he says, I ask you in the name of my grandfather Rasulullah to give me a sip of water because I am thirsty. Imam al Hussein salam is begging for water. My dear brothers and sisters, we're fasting during these days of the month of Ramadan. When we're hungry, when we're thirsty, remember that Imam al Hussein alayhi salam, he was hungry on the day of Ashura. Remember that Imam al Hussein alayhi salam, he was thirsty on the day of Ashura. On the night of the 11th of Muharram, Lady Zainab alayhi salam, she begins to gather all of the children, she begins to gather all of the orphans, she begins to gather all of the widows, when she realizes that there is one child from this gathering that is missing. It is said that Lady Zainab alayhi salam, she tells Um Kulthum to make sure that all of the children, all of the women, they remain in the tent while she goes and begins to walk around for this one child. Who is this child? This child is the daughter of Imam al Hussein alayhi salam, Ruqayya, Sukaina. It is said that at this moment, Lady Zainab alayhi salam, she begins to walk on the plains of Karbara when from a distance she sees that small daughter, three, four years old, and where is she? She is sleeping on the chest of Imam al Hussein alayhi salam. But how did she know that that was the chest of Imam al Hussein? Because the body of Imam al Hussein had no head on the day of Ashura. It is said that Lady Zainab alayhi salam, she goes toward her niece, she picks up the daughter, and she begins to take her back. And she says, Oh, my daughter, how did you know that that was the body of your blessed? How do you know that that was the blessed body of your father, Imam al Hussein alayhi salam? She says and she responds that when I was walking and when I was calling out for my father, I heard a call coming out from the jugular vein. Oh my Shia, that whenever you are drinking a sip of water, then remember my thirst. And whenever you hear the call of the, of the oppressed one, then weep over me and remember me. Inna lillah wa inna ilayhi rajihun. We pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to hasten the reappearance of our Imam, Imam Hujjat ibn Hassan al Mahdi. We pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us amongst those who are able to reflect and contemplate upon the Holy Quran. We pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to accept our a'mal during this holy month of Ramadan. We pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to continue to give us the tawfiq to perform his a'mal and to get closer to him so that we are able to reach him on the day of judgment with a purified heart. Walhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen Wa sallillahumma ala sayyidina wa nabiyyina Muhammadin wa alihi al-tahirin wa rahimallah man qara surat al-mubarakat al-fatiha.